much, Charlie. This meeting is being live streamed. Um, yeah, I've got the, I can see it come confirmed. You get it confirmed before I even do, which is amazing. <laughs> now it comes on to me and it's a circling ball and then I have to mute it and then we go. All right. Good. Okay. It is 11 o'clock on the dot and we say good morning. Welcome to Community Church of Boston. My name is Dean. They call me the longtime member and presently acting administrator, also guitar player and bottle washer, among other things. And most recently librarian, because we inherited a mountain of books. And I would invite you all to come see our book collection. Invite you all to come, especially on Wednesdays. We're having this new uh, little lunch tradition. Uh, we had a minister here who, uh, who was here for 39 years. His name was Donald Lothrop, and he made meatloaf every Wednesday night. Um, we're going to change that tradition a little bit, and we're going to have pupusas every Wednesday noon. Um, and that would be pupusas that uh, Luis, our cook and janitor, brings from Chelsea because they are a dollar a piece. And we had one last Wednesday, and it was it was wonderful. We had a longtime member who's not been with us named Alan Perez. Many of you remember uh, Alan. He was very active about 20 years ago, and he's back, and he's really uh, raring to get involved again. We also had Amar Ahmad, who's a, a person who is going to be with us um, as part-time part -time staff to help us with uh, getting this this video Zoom broadcast more elegant and more graceful and more stylish and more powerful. Um, and he brought with him two interns from Northeastern. So we had a, a wonderful gathering for, for pupusas, and we're going to call it Pupusa Palusa. That's what we think we're going to call it. Every, every Wednesday, come by, get a full, a full guided tour of Community Church of Boston, of this old ornery building that we own and love uh, right in the heart of Copley Square, and that we are trying to do our, our, our best to be good stewards of, to make it a, a super efficient, energy efficient model for the city of Boston's similar buildings of which there are about 40,000. Um, so uh, Wednesday is, is our pupusa day. Um, I just wanted to say that by way of, of welcoming you and just beginning with a marvelous, marvelous thing. This is called, I just found out, Echinopsis tubiflora. This is a cactus plant that has been sitting on our windowsill on the front picture window for decades. We have never seen it bloom before. It bloomed this morning. There's like five or six of these. Thanks to, thanks to a, an app on my phone that took a picture of the, the plant and told me what its Latin name was. And thanks to the universe for this moment at Community Church where a cactus flowered for the first time ever. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, Magpie. We're just delighted to see you with us again. You sound so good, and you look so great, and we want to highlight you and hear some songs from you and hear about your recent um, rediscovery of the touring world and the travels. So welcome, Greg and Terry. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, well, thank you, thank Dean. You, Dean. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, yes, uh, we've just returned home last night from 10 days on the road and uh, it was exhausting. <laughs> but it was also wonderful. We do a lot of work in schools with kids, uh, literacy programs for disadvantaged children uh, that, that we designed called Dancing with Books, where people get to, you know, share one children's book and dance it, sing it, uh, and do visual arts around it. And so, so our work in schools of course, uh, I suppose that would probably uh, be a clue as to how we've been feeling this week. Um, we have been in tremendous 
grief, uh, as is uh, certainly a, a major portion of the population of this country. Um, and uh, so. Uh, and last night we. So I think I think the flower blooming on your cactus on your building you know, balcony is just absolutely a great sign that. Yes, life does go on. And of course, we started this Memorial Weekend doing a concert last night um, in New Jersey, Friday night. So um, now we're, we'd really love to sing for you a song that is pretty old. It was actually um, a poem by Robert Service. But we set it to music. So. And we set it to music after hearing um, our dear fellow worker, Utah Phillips, recite it. So um, here it is. It's called Michael. This one, of course, comes right out of World War I. There's something in your face, Michael I've seen it all the day There's something there That isn't, wasn't square When first you went away when first you went away It's just the army life, mother The drill, the left and right That puts the stiffening in your spine And locks your jaw up tight And locks your jaw up tight There's something in your eyes, Michael How they stare and stare You're looking at me now, son as if I wasn't there, as if I wasn't there. It's just the things I've seen, mother, the sights that come and come. A bit of broken, bloody pulp that used to be a chum, that used to be a chum. There's something in your heart, Michael, that makes you wake at night. Often when I hear you moan, I tremble in my fright. I tremble in my fright. It's just a man I killed, mother. Mother's son like me. Seems he's always haunting me. He'll never let me be. He'll never let me be. But maybe he was bad, Michael. Maybe it was right to kill the enemy you hate and fair and honest fight in fair and honest fight. But I did not hate at all, mother. He never did me harm. I think he was a lad like me who worked upon a farm. Who worked upon a farm. And what's it all about, Michael? Why'd you have to go? A quiet, peaceful lad like you When we were happy so When we were happy so It's them up above, Mother It's them that sits and rules We've got to fight the wars they make It's us as are the fools it's us as are the fools. And when will it end, Michael? What's the use, I say? Of fighting if whoever wins. It's us that's got to pay. It's us that's got to pay. Oh, it will be the end, Mother, when lads like him and me decide so wet to feed the ones above Decide that we'll be free Decide that we'll be free And when will that day come, Michael? And when will fighting cease? And simple folks may till their soil And live in love and peace And live in love and peace it's coming soon and soon, Mother, it's nearer every day When only those who work and sweat will have a word to say When all who earn their 
God is bred in every land and soil. With a well in the fellowship of all, the comradeship of toil. When we, the workers, all demand, what are we fighting for? Men then will end this stupid crime, the devil's madness. Here's a candle to start us out. Candle of hope in the midst of tragedy and horror. Candle of light in the midst of loneliness. Candle of community. Thank you, Greg and Terry. There's uh, right in front of me a table full of poetry books, including several Robert Service uh, books. Is among what we inherited is an enormous uh, amount of, of poetry books, which will um, become part of our, our library. And, um, and there's also a ton of books about all kinds of other things. Um, so I want to just start out with a few announcements and just community church news. Um, uh, also with us last Wednesday was um, Victor and Victor Wallace Inez Hedges. Victor's mother was a remarkable painter, uh, French painter. Her, her name was Diane Esmond, and. Um, they own an enormous uh, number of, of her paintings after she passed, um, and they have taken on her legacy. And we are going to do a, a, a huge display of her paintings here next fall. Um, it'll, it'll take up this entire 2,000 square feet of auditorium. All these beautiful things that... Um, our, our wonderful publications manager, Crystal Rollins Jackson, has designed will come down. Like, for example, this uh, banner behind us. Uh, see if I can show it the whole thing to you. And all of these other posters, like, like the Julian Assange and like the, um, the uh, Donziger poster over there. And most, most of all, I want to show you this one, which is... Um, these are uh, Crystal's illustrations of um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Say their names, Black Lives Matter, and we, uh, we especially highlight that on, on this um, anniversary of the killing of, of George Floyd. Um, and, and also just to, to recognize Crystal's incredible contribution to um, our, our work here. This, uh, this person is not just uh, um, a mere employee or office manager of the church. This person is a serious um, voice and, and thought processor of, of what goes on in this, in this auditorium as well as in our congregation. I want to just share a, a, a concern um, some of you who have been here recently uh, won't um, remember, but those of us who have been here a long time know about Diane Lerman um, and her, her husband, Marty Lerman, who uh, were enormous, uh, huge part of this church. Um, Marty passed about, uh, about uh, what is it, like eight years ago, but Diane is maybe on her last few days Keep her and her, her children, Carlos and Katrina, in, in your thoughts and, and prayers. Um, we will be uh, watching uh, hospice at J Diane's bedside in the next few days. Um, just thought I'd 
let you know about that. And that's Diane Lerman and the, the upcoming display by Diane Esmond, another Diane, the, the, the painter. Um, I wrote a note to myself, Beto O'Rourke, <laughs> and I just want to uh, tell you all to, to, to find him confronting Ted Cruz and what's that governor's name at their press conference and just telling, telling them in their face um, how awful it is that they say, oh, we can't politicize this moment in, in time. Oh, no, and they, they kind of had to walk Beto out of the, out of the room and he gave a, a, a little conference to the, the, uh, the gathered um, journalists. It was, it was, it's really a remarkable little, little clip to watch. Um, I wanna tell you about <clears throat> another event that's coming up this Friday of course, we said Pupusa Palusa on Wednesday. This is um, a Palestine solidarity concert, and it's a beautiful little hand-drawn thing, and um, and it's 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 the work of Kala Walsh. Kala is 17 years old and a force of nature, like you wouldn't believe. She came and visited us uh, right before she went on on her delegation to Cuba. After coming back from Cuba. Um, Kala has, has given us three forms of report back. One is a video that she produced. Two is, is an article that she wrote uh, for Mass Peace Action about the, um, the uh, uh, comparing abortion rights in Cuba with abortion rights in the United States. And third of all, uh, a Zoom uh, report back. Anyway, Kala is also organizing this Palestine solidarity event. And it's at the Elliott School in Jamaica Plain, which is a place I love, and uh, to stand with the Palestinian peoples and uh, fight for liberation, empower local community. It's a whole bunch of, a bunch of bands. It looks like they're all 20-year-olds. Uh, let me tell you the names of the bands. Dino Gala, Bed Bug, Puppy Problems, Sweet Petunia, Senseless Optimism, and the COMP. And these are these are these are going to be great. I'm going to do lights and sound for them. Uh, I, I, I um, uh, against all my better judgment of an uh, an old fart carrying uh, sound equipment. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I, I'm sure that 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 a few of these uh, one or two of these bands probably really suck. I sucked when I was 22. Um, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to meeting a whole bunch of young young bands who want to. Uh, sing for Palestine. So that's that's this Friday um, at the at the Elliott School in Jamaica Plain. It's right behind the First Parish Unitarian Church. Between it, there's that that's very very old historic uh, cemetery. Um, another thing I want to show you is is this document that was prepared by a friend of one of our patron saints named Jackie Royce. I, I forget his name, but he's he's like a, a, a elderly. Back Bay historian, and this is a complete uh, treatise on 565 Boylston Street, our building, and it was it was quite a quite an enlightenment. Um, I thought this building was built in 1910. It turned out 1877, and it, it progresses through all of the different purchases and sales of the building. It talks about. Um, when it, uh, who were the early occupants and the, the different surveys and the different um, neighbors, deeds and permits. Uh, it's, it's a really marvelous thing. And it has a picture from 1911. And it shows that our first floor was a car dealer, uh, an automobile that was called Alco. Um, Alco, a car dealer, and um, on the second floor was Amoroso uh, Investments and Insurance and Real Estate. On the third floor, uh, oh, I, I can't I can't read it. it is is a, a a beauty salon, and on the fourth floor is a, a lawyer's office, um, and on the fifth floor it says to let, to rent. It was vacant just like it is now. Uh, uh, luckily, we're using it well for all of our archives, and I invite you to come on a Wednesday, and I'll give you the full tour of this building. Um, we have another wonderful thing that's going on, uh, the, the legacy of Bob Dattilio, uh, probably the world's foremost Sacco and Vanzetti scholar. scholar. 
is all now on, on our third floor being processed and, uh, and cataloged for um, most likely contribution to the Boston Public Library where there's already a huge Sacco and Vanzetti collection. And, um, and that's hopefully where our Bob Dottilio Library will be, which is just this mountain of books of, of Bob's that, that, we, that we have. So come by, I would love to, to show you what's going on. We also got our, uh, our the first, the first little intervention, little, it's sort of, we call it uh, exploratory surgery on our roof. We got a, a grant from the city of Boston to, uh, to replace uh, our roof. And they did test cuts to find out what is down below the rubber. And uh, there's a whole, a whole archaeology to, to, to find there and, and figure out um, our design for our new roof. Uh, so that's happening as well here at Community Church. Um, that's, uh, that's what we got here. And finally, our, our, our little reading, which I love. I haven't done it for a couple of weeks. And this is Children of the Days by Eduardo Galeano. Um, May 29th, Vampires. Eduardo Galeano, by the way, is Uruguayan um, journalist and, and author of many, many books. Uh, I own them all, both in English and Spanish, and you can come see that collection at the church as well. Um, in the summer of 1725, Petar Blagojevich got out of his coffin in the village of Kisilievo, bit nine neighbors, and drank their blood. By order of the Austrian government, then in charge in these parts, the forces of order killed him definitively by driving a stake through his heart. Petar was first officially recognized vampire and the least famous. The most successful, Count Dracula, was born from the pen of Bram Stoker in 1897. More than a century later, Dracula retired. What forced him out wasn't the competition from the silly little vampires of Hollywood, which didn't bother him in the least. No, he was tormented by feats of a different magnitude. Faced with the mighty gluttons who founded banks, then made them founder, swilling blood as if the whole world were a neck, he knew his inferiority complex was terminal. Eduardo Galeano never ceases to amaze. Magpie, um, I want to tell you about something I got to do last Sunday, which was be part of uh, a tribute concert online to Leon Rosselson. It was it was just a really great reminder. I recorded a song of his. Uh, too many decades ago uh, and got to sing it. It's called The Ant and the Grasshopper and then got to hear um, Leon do a song which just blew me away. It was called My Father's Jewish World. Just a remarkable song. And, and many others who, uh, who paid tribute by doing his songs. Anyway, uh, this was put on by the People's Music Network, which is where I first heard about Magpie. And um, I want to just use that to bring them back in the spotlight to do a couple of more songs for us. Well, you know, Dean, we, we also uh, did way back decades ago, Leon Rosselson's song, The World Turned Upside Down. And um, we, we love his music and we wanted to see you do that, but we were busy working too. The typical problem with musicians. We had an well, interesting experience though, just on Friday night, because we sang your song, Salmon, Salmon River, Salmon River at, the, uh, at the Troubadour concert series in Morristown, New Jersey. Because we were celebrating um, Rachel Carson's 115th birthday. Yeah, and we just, and we talked about you and how when we met you at PMN weekend and you sang Salmon River and I remember coming up to you after you sang it and I said, I think it's the best damn fish song I ever heard. And uh, so we had to learn it. But you know, we have a lot of musical heroes and sheroes. So we're gonna do a song from Phil Oaks, uh, who's always been a major inspiration to us. Um, and it's about what we're thinking about, hopefully this Memorial Day weekend. It's called, Is There Anybody Here? Now back in the 1960s, when uh, I was a young upstart folk singer and um, and then I had to register for the draft, it was this song and a few other songs um, in, in the same vein 
that inspired me to go and register uh, as a conscientious objector. As back in World War One, they called them shirkers or, or conchies. Um, and uh, so I achieved conscientious objector status and, uh, and did alternate service when I was ultimately drafted. But um, here's Phil Oak's song asking that question that perhaps some people should need to answer. Maybe they should do a little research before they try attempt to answer the question too. Is there anybody here who'd like to change his clothes into a uniform? Is there anybody here who thinks they're only serving on a raging storm? Is there anybody here with glory in his eye? Loyal to the end, whose duty is to die. I want to see him. I want to shake his hand. I want to call his name. Gonna call his name. Metal on the man. Is there anybody here who'd like to wrap a flag around an early grave? Is there anybody here who thinks they're standing taller on a battle wave? Is there anybody here who'd like to do his part? Soldier to the world. I want to see him, I want to wish him luck, I want to shake his hand, gonna call his name, put a medal on the man. Is there anybody here, proud of the parade, that'd like to give a cheer and show they're not afraid? I'd like to ask him what he's trying to defend. I'd like to ask him what he thinks he's gonna win Is there anybody here who thinks that following the orders takes away the blame? Is there anybody here who wouldn't mind a murder by another name? Is there anybody here who would like Is there anybody here with glory in his eyes? I want to shake his hand, gonna call his name, put a medal on the man. Is there anybody here so proud of the parade, who'd like to give a chair and show they're not afraid? I'd like to ask him what he's trying to defend. I'd like to ask him what he thinks he's gonna win. Is there anybody here who thinks that following the orders takes away the blame? Is there anybody here who wouldn't mind a murder by another name? Is there anybody here with glory in his eye, loyal to the end, whose duty is to die? I want to see him. I want to shake his hand, gonna call his name, put a medal on the man, put a medal on the man, put a medal on the one that we wrote uh, back during um, the administration of uh, W. 2005 we wrote this and we were doing a performance uh, at the Woody Guthrie Center in uh, Great Barrington and uh, it was a special peace um, concert and because of that war we just felt compelled to write this. It's called where have they all gone? So you'll remember that during uh, the uh, Iraq War, uh, 
the invasion of Afghanistan and then the Iraq war, um, there had been a virtual blackout on news coming out of the war. And, you know, uh, during Vietnam, we will, most of us remember that the nightly news reports were full of uh, film footage from the front, uh, soldiers being uh, attacked being and, and attacking, bombs going off, and then the images of the many uh, coming home on uh, stretchers, if they were lucky, and in body bags uh, and in coffins, in those metal coffins that they would offload in Delaware. And um, we were uh, we certainly disturbed by the fact that we weren't seeing those images. We would have been disturbed by the images, but perhaps as would ha as happened in Vietnam, the Vietnam War, we perhaps would have been disturbed to act. Um, but uh, we didn't uh, see those things. So it was a question of what, what's happened to them all. we sent across the sea to do the bidding of the powerful to kill for you and me where are their lonely coffins draped with our country's flag where are the ones on stretchers and in black body bags can we ever know? The price that they have paid For someone else's barter Their loyalty betrayed Where have they all gone? who lost a leg, a hand, their young lives forever altered, in a far off oil rich land, and the ones forever haunted by the horrors they have seen, is this the price of liberty, just what does freedom mean? Can we ever know the price that they have paid for someone else's barter, their loyalty betrayed? Why does Our Lady Liberty Stand trembling in fear, deaf and blind and silent. She won't speak or see or hear. They hide from us the suffering, the agony, the pain. They hide from us the violence that they do in our name. Where have they all gone? Dying soldiers by the score And among the suffering innocent Are many thousands more The widow and the orphan Will bear the lifelong toll The bloody stain of corporate gain Forever scars our soul can we ever know the price that 
that we have paid for someone else's barter. Our loyalty betrayed. Our loyalty betrayed. Thank you, Terry and Greg. That's beautiful. That's moving. Couple things before we bring on Matthew. I want to read you a, a quick little note that was sent um, from Japan. Hello, Dean Stevens. How are you doing? Uh, greetings to Community Church of Boston. I hope you are doing well. This is Takeshi. My name is Takeshi Takemuro. I live in Kyoto City, Japan. I am a sexual survivor long ago. Today, May 5th, Children's Day in Japan. I am sending to you handmade bookmark. Thank you for your programs and for your blessings. Takeshi Takemuro with a little, uh, a little, uh, a little drawing that he wrote with a peace symbol. Um, quick rundown on uh, upcoming events. Next, uh, next Sunday, we are very happy to welcome Jonathan Katz who wrote a book about one of our heroes at Community Church, Smedley Butler. Um, Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines, and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. Uh, that's next week. Um, uh, very much looking forward to, to Jonathan's uh, presentation, music by David Roth that day. The week after that, we have uh, Leonard Lerman and Helene Spearman. Leonard Lerman is a uh, classical pianist and composer, has written uh, an opera about the Rosenbergs and finished another opera about Sacco and Vanzetti, who are um, heroes in our pantheon and a pretty important part of our uh, DNA at Community Church, going back to our beginnings in 1920, when we were very involved in the defense of Sacco and Vanzetti. It was the first uh, political cause that we got deeply behind. And we have Sacco and Vanzetti all over all over this this church, including a very famous plaque on the wall. Um, the week after that, um, oh, and I'll mention June, June 12th is is Leonard Lerman, Helene Spearman. Come and be live for that because it's 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 a, a music concert, and we have a beautiful piano that will be recently tuned, and um, and you should you should take advantage of live music to be here live. Uh, we encourage. Um, uh, being vaccinated and wearing masks if you're not presenting or speaking. Um, uh, come on down if you feel uh, safe and feel good. We try to also uh, ventilate this auditorium as best we can according to the weather conditions. We are also looking into um, spending a, a good chunk of, of money on um, on ventilation, new a new ventilation regimen for this auditorium. So we take it seriously, but we want you to be here uh, live with us to enjoy this incredible auditorium that we have here. Um, the last presentation is on uh, June nineteenth, Juneteenth, and the the presenter is named Greg Williams. He's a retired uh, district court judge down on the Cape. And he has a presentation that's uh, about um, antebellum slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, and our, um, our musicians that day come to us from Switzerland. It's Matt Callahan and Yvonne Moore. They have just recorded a, a, a record of abolitionist songs from the early 19th century. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a rich bunch of things that we have coming up here. Community Church, join us. Join us physically in person on a Sunday and have lunch with us afterwards, or else join us virtually if, if you desire from anywhere on the planet. Um, uh, let's see, there's also, I can't forget, July 10th is a memorial service for Carolyn Poinelli, 
our longtime um, uh, not member. She joined. She joined the church just just a year before she passed, uh, but longtime, very very involved um, uh, participant at community church. Who passed away in March, um, tragic accident. Um, but her her memorial, and I hope a lot of people from community church will will be here that day because she was just uh, probably one of our most faithful attendees uh, of of just about anybody. Um, July tenth at, at one p.m. Um, also, just a quick rundown on summer activities. July fourth, anti-imperialist picnic. Um, Dan Kantoff is one of the, the organizers of that. It happens every year. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's at Christian Herder Park that's on the Charles River in, 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 in Alston there. And um, also uh, July, August 9th is our Nagasaki Day observance, which we will be um, doing again this year. Any folks who are interested in getting involved and helping organize these events and deciding on participants, please be in touch and um, we will get going. Um, so I think that's all I've got. Um, and I want to introduce Joan Livingston. Joan was the person who uh, who <clears throat> suggested we, we bring Matthew for Memorial Day. Joan has made many wonderful suggestions on speakers to us, uh, like, for example, Ray McGovern. I'd never heard of the dude, and he is <laughs> an amazing presenter who, is, who has been with us for a number of uh, events, including last year's uh, Julian Assange Saquon Vanzetti Award event. Anyway, Joan, take it away. I will. I'm Hi, Joan. Hi, I'm lucky to know wonderful people, and actually Matthew and Ray are friends as well. Um, I wanted to keep this as brief as possible. There's some history. This might I know my grandparents and my father, they, they thought of this as Decoration Day, and there was a day when you would put poppies on the graves of, you know, just our dead, but not, but um, that you had a, a, a magical cactus blossom is part of the tradition of using flowers to honor. And what I always liked here, my own uh, VFP chapter, which is named after Smedley, we would toss flowers for not just US dead, which is, I mean, Biden's already been to the tomb of the unknown. I'm afraid he might create a few more unknown, but to remember the, all victims of war so-called ours and theirs. And we, we would always have, for example, Iraqi refugees. And this is pretty much an anniversary when many of us um, were in Chicago for protest of NATO, where a lot of Iraq veterans of the, the wars on Iraq and Afghanistan, which would be like Matthew, threw their medals back. And they were on a stage with Iraqis, Afghans, and Pakistanis. So the, the idea that there are many victims of war that you do not just consecrate, et cetera, um, the Lincoln's you know, scripture, our own dead, but what happens to the whole world when you know there are crazy people out there? It was, a, I think, Flanders Field and Poppies or something that, uh, that my, 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 grand, my grandparents and my, my, my grandfather was in the great class war of, uh, as, as Jacques Powell calls it, um, that the US entered late. I met, met, I heard Matthew speak a very long time ago. I think it was 2009. It might have been from for Mass Peace. And at the time, he was working in Obama State Department. He had already been a he, he is a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. So he's familiar with U.S. state terrorism. And he had you may all recall, there were, Obama made a lot of promises. The only one he kept was that to escalate the war on Afghanistan, which was not the first US war there. Um, and when I first heard Matthew, he already had his own plans that were sort of different from Obama's. And he, not, not long after that, he quit the State Department over you know, the continued sacking of, of, of a nation that had never attacked us. Um, so he was a Marine. Um, I know that 
he, he is technically 100% disabled, which would probably involve both mental and physical things he could talk about, but he is still strong enough and has a strong enough network that he is running as a green. So that means peace, people, and planet um, for Senate in North Carolina. And uh, he, I think his, um, his resignation from state was very public. Uh, you know, not not a an espionage act thing, but an act of conscience. And I'm always impressed by the people who go to war, and then say, "What? Do you, these are not my enemies. You know, why? What am I doing here?" He is, you know, from from the the um, newsletter write up. He can talk more about it, but that he is a he's a peace worker. I take it at a center for um, international policy and. I noticed in the audience is Poppy Leland. That, I mean, there people who go from being in a war to dedicating their lives to peace are a rare and precious breed. We also had Brian Wilson, who, um, you know, the government tried to kill him for trying to stop AIDS the Conqueror. So I think Matthew Ho is in that mode of, you know, paying the price for peace and will have a lot to say about what whether we should be remember one person said we're remembering wrong because every year there are more dead and more wars i mean decoration day actually was uh, something during the civil war if you can believe that and um i i always think of it in a world war one context but that's a lot of wars ago and as in the phil oak song which um i which is kind of a complete u.s history of of wars so um I want to now shut up and let Matthew say what he can on why Memorial Day and why not fewer wars and less to remember. Take it away. <laughs> and thank you for that, th that magical cactus. There we go. Thanks so, thanks so much, Joan. Um, I really appreciate you uh, recommending me to speak and and i appreciate our, our friendship very much and uh thank you to the community church of boston for having me here uh actually i when i was out of college i went to tufts university but before i joined the marine corps i worked uh, uh right block about a block away from you all uh down in where the old fao swartz uh yeah. used to be uh for houghton mifflin the publishing company um mm -hmm. And so uh, I've got I've got fine fond memories of getting off the green line, yes. walking yes. past your church and going into work as a 22 year old who was bored out of his skull doing finance for a publishing company and uh, couldn't get on with a fire department. So I thought that the Marine Corps was the best way to like live a, a life of um, purpose and seriousness and responsibility and adventure, improve himself, et cetera. And um, all these years later, you know, more than 20, gosh, 25 years later, uh, here here we are. Uh, I, I also want to say you brought up the poppies. Uh, you can see on my lapel, I wear a white poppy. Uh, most people are familiar with war on poppies with the red poppies, which uh, tend to signify remembrance of uh, soldier death, of veterans deaths. And uh, the white poppy stands for the remembrance of all deaths. And actually, it, 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 we don't do it that much here in the US. But if you go to Britain, uh, uh, it's the, the red poppies are a ritual that everyone wears. Uh, very similar, uh, you know, during Remembrance Day, as they call as they call it, uh, 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 Armistice Day, uh, Veterans Day here in the US now, uh, the, the British uh, all wear the red poppies. If you're there during that time, you get on the tube, say in London, uh, you know, people look at you funny if you're not wearing a red poppy. It's that degree of religious ritual. It, it's very similar here in the United States to if you learn someone's a veteran, there is that obligation to say thank you for your service, which is religious in nature. Like that, that it's 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 blasphemous heresy. It's it's it is it is wrong to not thank a veteran for their service in this country in the same way. And so, actually, in, in Britain, uh, the white poppies are controversial because they are somehow disrespectful 
to the veteran deaths, right? I mean, so it what we deal with here with the politicization of war, the 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 use of war uh, um, to cudgel any opposition or dissent or discussion, uh, you know, is, is not is not something unique to the United States. Um, also, before I forget, I just want to say uh, uh, thank you to to uh, 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 Greg and Terry for that wonderful music. Uh, thank you so much. And um, you all have Jonathan Katz coming up next week, which is really cool. Um, I've not read his new book, uh, but I follow his writings. I read his re readings every week. His writings every week for, uh, that he publishes on Substack and follow him on Twitter. And he really is a, a, a fantastic historian and, and commentator. So. Uh, and then um, finally, thanks for everyone who's listening in and watching, uh, including my friend Packy uh, Wheeland, uh, uh, you know, who is one of my heroes, uh, just like so many other uh, uh, women over at Code Pink are, uh, you know, really inspirations uh, to me. Um, I just wanted to start uh, just uh, it's been brought up the Civil War. I uh, just read a section from Walt Whitman's uh, poem. Um, when lilacs last in a dooryard bloomed. And um, just a brief section. So if anyone knows this poem, they know it's quite long. Um, but Whitman writes, I saw battle corpses, myriads of them, and the white skeletons of young men. I saw them. I saw the debris and debris of all the slain soldiers of the war. But I saw they were not as was thought. They themselves were fully at rest. They suffered not. The living remained and suffered. The mother suffered. And the wife and the child and the musing comrade suffered. And the armies that remained suffered. Um, I, I think that concept, that worry not for the dead, uh, is one that we can take in a manner that is appropriate, yet also is grossly inappropriate. In Whitman's time in the Civil War, there were, of course, civilian deaths in war, but not in like there are now, where estimates are 90% of the casualties of modern war are civilians. Uh, even in the First World War, uh, the catastrophe of, of the tens of millions of dead, uh, you saw that uh, still, the majority of the dead, the majority of, of, of the wounded, those who were uh, directly, uh, uh, you know, bearing the, 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 the brutality of the war, were the armies. Um, and then that, of course, changes, uh, particularly with, uh, uh, you know, beginning of, of the use of aircraft and the extension of artillery and things like that. But to where you get to the Second World War, uh, certainly we saw uh, the development of, of of uh, you know terrorism through war against uh, the Central American and Caribbean states by the United States during the interwar period, uh, but then especially once you get to the Spanish Civil War and then the Second World War, you see this shift where civilians become the uh, victims of war much more so than the soldiers are. Uh, not saying that you know tens of millions of soldiers didn't perish in the Second World War, but I think you understand my point. Um, I, I struggled with what I wanted to say here today for a myriad of reasons and, and um, uh, started writing something down and stopped and then, um, you know, thought, well, maybe I should talk about uh, this is uh, this is the genesis of Memorial Day or this is how other nations do it or just go into a litany of, of all the uh, statistics uh, of our of our wars of of current wars and past wars and and trying express some degree of the magnitude of it and none of that sat well with me and um i, I thought of my own experiences on memorial day let me first just caveat this by saying as i discuss this i am fully aware that we need more memorial days that memorial day is not something simply that should be uh for uh, the victims of uh, those who participated, uh, those who, who, who died and suffered in uh, American wars overseas. I think it's right and it's just that there be memorial days 
uh, a constant remembrance of the victims of all forms of violence and oppression, uh, that we need more moral days uh, for the victims of COVID, for the 60,000 who die uh, without a pandemic every year, without health insurance, for the victims of racial injustice, uh, for the, the victims uh, of poverty, you know, uh, uh, you know, a form of, of deliberate state violence against the people. Uh, I, I think all those things that Memorial Day, as we discuss this and 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 and, and expand upon it, is something that we need for all uh, uh, of our wars, whether they be the wars overseas or the wars here at home, uh, which are inextricably linked. Uh, they are mirrors upon themselves. And that's a, a thing I learned uh, very much through Veterans for Peace, that our wars overseas are mirrors of our wars here at home. Um, I think that answers, I think, my que the question of, of, the, this, the, the, of the topic of this uh, talk of whether or not we need a Memorial Day and how do we have a Memorial Day uh, when uh, American politicians, the media, uh, large elements of American industry are addicted uh, to war. And I think one of the things is, as I look back and as reflecting on this, is my own fixation on Memorial Day as a physical, uh, a physical occurrence as a place. And I think uh, a lot of people think of Memorial Day so strictly as the three day weekend. And you hear that criticism for those who want to celebrate Memorial Day, particularly use it for the propaganda values that it has. You know, how dare you not honor our war dead who gave us these freedoms now continue to shell tens of billions of dollars to Raytheon, Northup, Boeing, et cetera. I think the uh, attitude of many people uh, who are criticized because they see Memorial Day as the start of summer. This is when the pool opens at the apartment complex, uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, you know, chicken on the grill. You know, those were criticized that way because they are not being respectful to those who died for their freedoms. I think those people who are viewing this particularly as a three day weekend, first and foremost, uh, are in the right because what freedoms are they celebrating? What freedoms were won? for the American people in Korea, throughout Central America, in Vietnam, uh, all throughout the Muslim world. Uh, uh, today, of course, you know, throughout Africa, the greater Middle East, you know, in my lifetime, uh, war has ravaged uh, from the west coast of Africa all the way through to Pakistan. There, in, in, in my lifetime, there has not been one country that I can think of with a, a few prominent exceptions, such as uh, Saudi Arabia. But even Saudi Arabia has been rocked at times by uh, uh, incredibly unstable, uh, incredibly, incredibly destabilizing coups and revolts and acts of terror uh, that are part of that larger war. And that instability, of course, comes from uh, primarily US, but Western intervention uh, desire for control throughout the Muslim world from the west coast of Africa to Pakistan. And then, of course, the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions who have suffered directly from that. Um, so when you look at this in that sense and you say, well, what freedoms were won? What, why, why should we put first uh, the flag uh, as opposed to our barbecue? Uh, it is easy to understand why people don't why people don't agree with that. And I, so I think those who don't put Memorial Day first as some type of religious observance uh, to American exceptionalism um, are in the right, uh, even though they are so harshly criticized by uh, those who demand uh, the observance of Memorial Day as, again, a, a, a religious holiday for the state. For me, I struggle with it because I tie Memorial Day to a place. I tie it to uh, a, a physical location that you go and you pay your respects and you grieve. For me, most especially, this goes 15 years back uh, to Memorial Day in 2007. I was back for my second deployment in Iraq and um, went to Arlington National Cemetery. 
and it was a very painful, difficult experience. And, and one of the things um, it, it, I, I talk about and write about a lot is moral injury, uh, you know, particularly how that manifests into suicide among uh, America's combat veterans as well as combat veterans around the world. And uh, one of the things that happens when you're over in these wars is you take no time to grieve. You take no time to acknowledge what has happened to a friend of yours. Um, you just continue on with the mission, as we would say. Uh, and that extends to a larger degree. That, that extends to this idea as well that you take no time to think about what you're doing over there. The big picture questions of the Iraq war never came up among us. Not because we were, we were uh, daft or because we were uninterested or because we, we simply were too selfish, but because simply that's not how things worked over there. Things moved too quickly. You were too consumed. Uh, in the actions of the war to ponder anything about it. And that included when your friends were killed. You had a brief memorial service and that was it. You moved on. And so when you get home, that is when all these things, whether it's the personal grief or the great big questions of the war, that's when it opens up. And I think that's where you see the differences in mental health, emotional health, spiritual health uh, between veterans, those who are no longer in uniform, and active duty service members, those who are. So going to Arlington Cemetery that day in May 2007 was an act that forced me to, to confront some of these things. At that point, uh, when you would go to Arlington, you would have to, they were not, they were not the automatic kiosk. Now you go now and you, you, you go up to the kiosk and you type in the person's name. It's all digitized, just like anything else. You go into a Taco Bell. That's how you order your burritos now, right? I mean, like, so the same in Arlington, 15 years ago, you had to go to a person. And so the act of going it up to somebody and saying, I need the location for train mcleod i need a location for uh joe ellis i need right i mean was incredibly difficult for me because that was the first act uh i had to deal with the grief and then of course going and visiting the graves and everything else and so for me that solidified memorial day as a place um but there was something missing because even though I grieved and I grieved, I walked up uh, uh, in, in, a, in a, a, a moment, uh, a literary type moment where most of the Iraq and Afghan war dead are buried over in what's called Section 60. Um, as I walked over there, I, uh, when I got to it, I said, OK, let's look and see what, what and you find the graves because the graves are all numbered. Um, you find, OK, let's see where Joe's where Joe's uh, uh, grave grave is, where his, his, his tombstone is. And so I went to check the grave of the one I was standing at, and it was Joe Ellis's grave. I walked right up to it without knowing it. And within 10 seconds, I had collapsed on my knees and was engulfed in tears and couldn't recover uh, for 15 minutes. Uh, you know, I don't know if I've ever cried like that in my life. And, um, you know, the same and then went to this and went to 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 uh, Mark Farwell's and, and, and others and 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 there was something missing and it, and it plagued me and it bothered me because even though I committed this, act, I, I had or taken part in this act of grieving, uh, there was something still that was not there. And this. This coincided with my dis dissent against the war, with my continued disagreement with personal disagreement with the war, as well as what I saw as the injustice of it, even though I continued to serve. And so, you know, this connection, Memorial Day, for me as a place or as an act uh, of grieving, really was not holding as I maybe thought it would. It was not healing as I thought it would. And it was not certainly forgiving as I expected or hoped it would. Um, contrast that as well with the other versions of Memorial Day uh, that we have, uh, you know, whether they be parades, whether they be uh, celebrations of militarism, um, whether they be advertisements for the military industrial complex and for recruiting for the military, 
Um, contrast that with uh, what an actual Memorial Day could be. You know, in my sense, there was grieving without purpose. And to tie back to what Whitman says about how the dead no longer suffered, the dead did not suffer. What I realized was that my grief, my heartbreak, my guilt, my shame, regret was not for the dead, but rather for those who injustice had been inflicted upon who had been provided no relief and no, and no opportunity to receive such relief. And I really understood this then as having uh, three aspects to it in terms of what I was looking for, what was, what was driving me to suicide. One, an anger, because there was no accountability that these wars have been waged, that these wars have been, have been uh, 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 built upon lies, sustained upon further lies, enabled by political cowardice or, or at best indifference, uh, all for a, 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 a racket of, uh, of great wealth for banks, weapons companies, fossil fuel companies, and other kind of, you think of these other, other companies that are like those little fish that swim under the mouth of the shark, right? And snatch their crumbs. Uh, so that anger, then the, the, the shame, the shame of having taken part in something that did such harm to so many tens of millions of people and continues to do harm. You know, this need for some form of repentance, some way to make good on what I had done, some way to find a way to make up for, in some manner, what myself and others like me had done to so many tens of millions of innocent people and continue to do to tens of millions of innocent people. These wars, like all wars, as Whitman suggests, don't end. There is a mental and emotional and spiritual suffering that continues and passes down through generations. Uh, but there's also a physical uh, a, a devastation that continues because of the environmental pollution of war, whether it be from unexploded bombs, leftover landmines, or just the actual toxic pollution. We know this, we see this uh, in Vietnam. The uh, uh, millions of Vietnamese who suffered uh, and suffer from the lasting effects of the American chemical weapons program in Vietnam, the largest weapons, chemical weapons program in the history of mankind, the Agent Orange program, as we're familiar with, a, a program that for generations will continue to inflict suffering on thousands of Vietnamese families every year because that toxic is passed through generations into children. And every day in Vietnam, there are dozens of children who are uh, born with uh, birth defects, disabilities, uh, uh, or stillborn uh, due to a war that officially ended 50 years ago, or almost 50 years ago. The same with in Iraq. In Iraq, even if we were to wave a magic wand and say, you know, all your troubles are gone, all your political troubles are gone. All your troubles with the Islamic State are gone. All your, your sectarian conflict that we began, we, the United States, began by invading your country and occupying it and putting into place a divide and conquer strategy between your various sects. Even if we were to say all that's gone and everything is good now, for generations, the Iraqis will continue to suffer. Their, conti their children will continue to die because of the pollution, because of the cancer we have caused from our war there. In Iraq, there are places that have higher cancer rates than Hiroshima or Nagasaki did after the atomic bombings because of the pollution of our wars. And so these are things, of course, Afghanistan, uh, another example you see with Yemen, uh, Syria, all throughout Africa, et cetera, Western Pakistan. Um, these are all the lasting effects of war to which you say the third aspect where is the justice? Where is the justice for these people? 
aside from the accountability for those in the United States who created and led and sustained these wars, aside for the repentance, uh, the atonement, uh, the somehow striving for forgiveness, which I don't know, I don't believe is possible, but you strive for it, for those of us who took part in these wars. Uh, there is a need for justice. There is a need for justice for the victims of the war. And I think as we look at what does Memorial Day mean, why do we need a Memorial Day? We need a, a living act. Uh, we need an experience. Uh, we need a, a purpose based on accountability, based on repentance, based on justice. And we can provide, we can move forward with that if we remember if we memorialize and one of the things i don't like about the term memorialize and is that seems like it makes things frozen right i mean memorialize if you have the uh if you have a a, a, a memorial bridge someplace it's because that person died and we named him we named a bridge after them and so it's frozen there's nothing you can do you can build a structure and that's it because that person's dead and i don't think so i don't think memorial is is maybe perhaps the right word for what i'm trying to describe here certainly we need to recognize and seek justice for those who were killed in these illegal uh, uh, criminal wars. However, um, the idea that justice must be gained for those who are still suffering, who are still victims. And so one of the things I think as we move into the, the Q&A, what I would like to discuss and hear from folks or ideas for how do we make this a living experience? How do we make this a real act? Uh, and of course, as I said earlier, my conversation here is just really restricted towards uh, the, the, the wars overseas. But as I said, it, this, this, this can be and should be expanded to the wars here at home uh, in all their forms, all the various forms of state violence. Uh, whether it be physical, economic, uh, cultural, uh, political, uh, you know, all the various aspects uh, that we employ, uh, we, not you and I, but uh, the general sense of we, the United States employs throughout society to oppress others that cause such great suffering, harm, death. This idea uh, that somehow we can remember and move forward with that remembrance as being the uh, 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 the the the, uh, the act that uh, causes us to act further is certainly not anything new and certainly you know something that you as members of the community church of boston uh have very close uh to your hearts how do you how do you live with the history and use that history for acts of justice to maintain to, to attain some degree of accountability and to continue to better ourselves whether if you are a perpetrator like myself or whether you were someone who actively opposed these wars uh you know i always find it interesting to be in these 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 conversations um as a perpetrator uh, something I take very, very seriously and something that I still I struggle with and will rightfully struggle with for the rest of my life with the good people who oppose these things from the get go with the people like Greg, who recognize the, the, the wrongness, the illegality, the horror of the Vietnam War and became a conscience objector and from what I can gather has devoted his life to peace and justice, whereas someone like me as a perpetrator knew it was wrong, continue to go with it for multitude of reasons um and to so to sit in these types of spaces uh for me is an honor to be included with people who saw wrong at the get-go and chose not to go along with it rather than someone like me who saw wrong decided to go with it again for a myriad of reasons some personal some because i thought i could change things some because i thought i i one thing i will always tell people is that when you're dealing with such extreme acts of immorality as war no matter how moral you think you are you will always become an agent of the immorality because your own degree of moral agency is nothing it's insignificant it is it's a grain of sand against the ocean uh, of immorality that war is uh but you know this, this this notion of how do we go forward how do we make uh memorial day not just one day in uh in uh may dedicated every year as a celebration 
of American exceptionalism, of mass political violence, of organized murder, of a uh, reason why we need to shovel more money to uh, the weapons companies and their attendant fossil fuel companies and banks. Uh, how do we make this uh, something that is a, a living experience, uh, some kind of purpose uh, you know, that provides, that helps us move towards uh, accountability, uh, that moves towards uh, 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 forgiveness, atonement, repentance for those who are perpetrated. And of course, most importantly, move forward for justice, justice for the tens of millions of people whose lives have been shattered, who, who the tens of millions of families whose futures are, 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 are devastated and gone throughout, especially these last 20 years, the Muslim world. Um, how do we achieve that justice? So I will uh, end it at that. I look forward to uh, the q and A. I I really appreciate you all taking the time um, for me uh, to speak. Um, I will say, as I look at my notes in horror, I forgot my Cornell West quote, uh, which I meant to kick this whole thing off. Uh, uh, Cornell West, just to, I guess, maybe put a capstone on this. Um, Cornell West rightfully says that we live in this country at the intersection of might makes right and greed is good. And I don't think how you can look at Memorial Day, particularly in light of the wars overseas, particularly in light of the wars here at home, the massacre that occurred in Buffalo or in Uvalde, Texas these last weeks, and not see that intersection of might makes right Greed is good, and how Memorial Day, as as the United States celebrates it now, is not uh, an explicit celebration of might makes right and greed is good. So thank you uh, all, and yeah, I look forward to Q and A, uh, and yeah, I really appreciate you all having me here. Matthew, thank you so much. It's just great to hear from you. And um, I just want to invite you to come be with us physically here in Boston sometime soon or virtually either way. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the moment that we uh, that put out our, our hand or our collection basket and tell you this beautiful, we are going to hypnotize you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we depend on, on your generosity to keep this thing going. Um, and we have uh, a, a building that's a, a money hole, um, but uh, we, we, we do it somehow and we continue. We've been doing it for 102 years and help us make that another century um, by going to our website, communitychurchofboston.org, and you can uh, put in a credit card or you can do a PayPal, which is kind of uh, not my preference anymore, hearing about some of PayPal's antics recently around, um, around Palestine and around some journalists and, and whatnot, but, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, I want to bring back uh, our friends, Magpie, uh, Greg and Terry, to uh, take us out with one last uh, song, and then we'll have a, a question and answer with, with Matthew. Can't hear you yet. Okay, can you hear us no, now? No, yes. Okay. You moved yeah. us both very, very uh, much, Matthew. Um, I'm a, a survivor of Kent and Jackson shootings, Kent State. Uh, it was my freshman year there. And the military, with their, you know, tanks and things, surrounded us and uh, killed four and wounded nine. So, you know, I have that uh, terrorism that we have to fight in this country as well as abroad where we send, send people. So, um, and Greg, did you want to say something too? I just wanted to say I really appreciate you drawing the connections between war and 
and all of, the, all of the things that it's connected to. Uh, and uh, so, um, so uh, this is uh, Phil Oak's great anti-war song. It was it's one of the major anthems of the movement to end the war in Vietnam. Uh, he ended the entire song without ever even mentioning Vietnam. Um, and uh, we updated it so just we, a wee bit. So we added to it a little bit, and um, and as you spoke, we added even more. Um, uh, but it's not that much longer <laughs> than the original song. So uh, I ain't marching anymore. Thank you, Greg and Terry. Powerful. Ain't watching anymore. Um, Matthew, I saw be in your backdrop that um, Assange poster that is framed in glass. And um, in the reflection of the glass frame, I saw a flag waving. And um, I, I got to thinking about um, my own tortured relationship with 
that flag. And thinking about a um, couple of things. The first, the first about how um, Native Americans love the American flag. And every powwow you see, um, th there's, there's that flag. Uh, another thing I thought about was community church. Um, I, I found out uh, in the minutes of 1941, uh, board of directors, that they decided for the first time that they were going to have on the stage of Symphony Hall, where they were meeting at the time, to uh, audiences of like up to 2,000, 2,500 people, they decided to display the flag. And that's uh, an American flag that is still folded uh, in a triangle and is up in a, in a closet on our fourth floor. And um, I thought about flags and I thought about um, people uh, who wrap themselves in the American flag. I thought about the, the, the hugest uh, football field size flags that you find at car dealerships. I thought about the flag, the Palestinian flag that got pulled off that coffin about two weeks ago when they were trying to bury um, Shireen uh, and, the, and the incredible inhuman indignity of, of that act. I, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the flag and your relationship with that symbol. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Uh, the flag that's flying right now is a Veterans for Peace flag. So, um, you know, I, I changed my flags out based upon uh, the holidays, based upon what's occurring. Uh, you know, before this, this VFP flag was up, there was a Palestine flag there, uh, you know, to um, uh, uh, honor uh, the Nakba uh and of course what is continually happening in palestine i have a you know june 1st uh june's pride month so i'll put up a pride flag you know i mean all those kinds of things is something um uh the american flag uh gives people purpose it gives people meaning i can remember being an officer candidate school and uh you know in the military you have it's called colors you know, when they raise the flag in the morning and when they take it down in the evening. And when they do that, um, they, they play, you know, uh, they, they, the bass loudspeakers, you know, make a noise and everyone stops what they're doing and you face the direction of the flag and you salute as the flag is either raised or as it's uh, being lowered. And I remember we were out on police call when I was an officer candidate at school. So we were all up on a line, you know, and you're walking across the ground, looking down, picking up cigarette butts or whatever you find. And um, that, you know, colors came. So everyone turns around and you salute the, the flag and gets lowered. And um, I remember at that point having that feeling of meaning, of purpose that I had been looking for. I was 23 years old, I guess, you know, that, that, that what, what I was talking earlier about working uh, at Houghton Mifflin in Copley Square, you know, the, 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 uh, I had studied uh, philosophy and literature and, and religion and other things in college. And I was looking for that purpose, you know, and I wasn't finding it, you know, doing uh, uh, finance uh, for the board of directors for a publishing company, um, you know, and so, uh, I remember that experience at Officer Candidate School in Quantico, Virginia, saluting the flag and feeling, my God, I have purpose. Like I'm part of something. Uh, I'm dedicated to something. This is giving me meaning. Uh, Chris Hedge's book, of course, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. I recommend that to everybody. You know, the, the, this knowledge, this idea that the flag is something that we ourselves are a part of and that it's meaning, it, 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 it's historical meaning, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, a, a, a spiritual meaning, it's political meaning, um, is something that we can call our own and make our own. And of course, that's fraught, right? Because the, the realities of what the flag has stood for, what this country has done, uh, has been horrific. 
for so, so, so many people, for so many civilizations, nations, for entire uh, 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 groups and categories and demographics of people within our own borders, how it continues to be. Think of the the, the crime against humanity that is occurring down uh, at our border, uh, our southern border, uh, you know, more than 20,000 people in detention, uh, more than Trump had in detention. Uh, the last thing I saw, at least a thousand children are still separated from their families down there. And over each of those detention centers, over each of those, over all those cages where these people are being held, fly American flags. Uh, so, I mean, that's, we could have plenty of examples of all this. So it's very fraught, it's very difficult, and you can see, understand how people very much see it as a symbol of oppression, of suffering, of exploitation, of imperialism, just as so many people see it as uh, the, the uh, s- uh, symbol of meaning, of purpose, okay, of 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 of, of opportunity, if you will. Uh, what I will say is that it's something that everybody has to. I think this might be a cop out, but it's something that everyone has to uh, struggle with and define for themselves. Uh, and remembering that it is only a piece of cloth, that it is at best a symbol and nothing more. That the reality of what we believe must be expressed through our actions, uh, whether uh, those actions are, uh, you know, however those actions are able to be presented, you know, putting yourself uh, in, in, in the service of your conscience, your values, your beliefs uh, in the service of others, however uh, it is best for you, uh, you know, whether it be uh, through uh, uh, putting your body on the street, uh, putting your money into organizations, uh, leading organizations, organizations, organizing organizations, um, voting, however it is, all the different things that we can affect change. And we have to do all those things. There's not one thing that we have to do all. But, you know, it is something I think we all have to struggle with individually. Um, And I will also say this, though, uh, the flag's not going anywhere. Uh, I, I don't think we are going to get a new flag anytime soon. I think we have a much greater ch- chance of, of getting, say, D.C. as a state uh, with, and had, having, adding a 51st uh, star to the flag, uh, which is, as I think most people agree, is a remote possibility. Uh, I, I think that's a greater possibility, though, than us of, of getting a different flag. So this is the flag that we have for good, for bad. And our job then is to make it actually mean to make it actually represent the values that we say it does. And it has failed over and over to do that. But it's not going anywhere, that flag. We're not going anywhere. Our values are unchanging and unmoved. And so it is our job to make those values, uh, uh, those principles, those beliefs, uh, what we what we understand to be right and just, to make those a, the, that a reality, which then the flag can represent. So uh, I... I, I, I like to hear what other people think about because it is the flag is uh uh some people it's it, it's it's very vexing for others it's very very cut and dry thanks matthew um beloved member and also longtime member of women's international league for peace and freedom virginia pratt you are next hi virginia hi thank you um Well, thank you very, very much, Matthew, for that substantive talk. I really appreciated your going way below the surface um, in your thinking. Um, I'm of the opinion that, um, so it's an opinion, so you can react to it, that we um, need to change the term service when we talk about the time that people spend in the military. And either if we're going to call time in the military service, call other things service or not call it service. Like um, I I once wrote a letter to the editor about how we should look at people who volunteer in homeless shelters, who teach little league, who um, work in community gardens, um, who a number of things volunteer in a lot of aspects that these are these are service and um, and really question um, 
you know, especially if you're going to think about volunteerism, that people get paid in the service. I mean, they might argue that they don't a lot, but, but, but I think if we stop referring it to it as service, like when somebody is a, is a grocery store worker or somebody is a truck driver or somebody is a postal office uh, mail delivery person, we, we describe them by their occupation. Mm-hmm. We say that's a service or um, per se. And so um, the reason I, I am of this opinion is that I think that a lot of people get um, co-opted um, their sense of duty and patriotism yeah. when people join the military and think that it's a service. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 I would encourage rethinking that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Virginia. Um, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because we say service members and then we say service workers, which is a term that I think we, we don't use as much anymore. And certainly during the pandemic, that got replaced by essential workers, which was a, 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 a term uh, that threw all kind of lavish praise on people who were exposed to the pandemic. But the actions behind it were completely lacking. Uh, meanwhile, with service members, uh, you know, there is a, a, a mountains of praise. If I went to the if I, if I went to the Carolina Hurricanes, New York Rangers game tomorrow night, at some point they're going to ask me and all the other veterans in attendance to stand up so the 20,000 people can applaud us, um, you know, let alone all the benefits and and um, uh, fiscal benefits that we that veterans receive. Uh, the 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 capture of that language, I think, is. Um, I, I don't think there was a, 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 a you know a coterie of, of people sitting around a smoke filled room who came up with the idea, but it certainly worked out that way. That our language has been captured to do exactly as what you're talking about to uh, to make. And this is what I said earlier about the, this this idea that thanking veterans it's a, it's like a religious ritual. It, it is unthinkable. It, it is it, it is it is wrong to not thank a veteran for their service. You know, I mean, it, it, it is, it, and that's the way the society has worked and that has been manipulated, has been formed, has been shaped to make sure that there is very little dissent, to make sure this is how, uh, and by extension, not just uh, uh, American uh, veterans, but war and militarism in general. I mean, you look at, say, what's happening with Ukraine right now, where uh, the entire Democratic Party in both the House and the Senate votes for $40 billion for Ukraine. Half of that money is going to Lockheed and Boeing and Raytheon um, without any discussion, without any dissent. Even Bernie Sanders, who champions himself uh, in many ways as one of the most anti-war members of Congress, and he certainly has his his faults with that. I'll you know, happy to bring those up later if you want. But, you know, he says, well, we should have a we should have a discussion on this, uh, but it's too urgent right now to have a discussion or something like that. Right. I mean, so like this, this, this idea that um, it's the service Right. The, 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 and again, I, I tie this to a religious, uh, 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 it's, it's religious in its nature. The holiness of this, the, ur- the urgency of this crusade is such that we cannot discuss where these, this $40 billion is going to. Or what does it mean when we are now paying the salaries of the Ukrainian army? Well, that basically means it's our army. You know, I mean, like, what does that mean in terms of being in war with Russia? You know, let alone any discussion over the last 20 years, let alone 40 years, let alone 75 years going back and forth. I mean, we see conversations about Native Americans, the the ongoing war against Native Americans, the ongoing genocide that's been going on for 500 years and continues. Uh, Any conversation about those kinds of things. And so the use of language, exactly, Virginia, like service members, and I'm guilty of, I probably said it two or three times during my talk, because I think a lot of it is just how we have been uh, formulated to speak about it. 
And if I'm being conscious about it, what I do try and say is I try and say soldiers, uh, because it, it, it took me a while to get out. I think I am good now about not saying uh, I served in Iraq or Afghanistan. I, 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 it, but that took me even after I was anti-war, right? Even after I was publicly speaking against the wars, that took me quite a while. That took me years to get that phrasing when I served in Iraq, even as I was saying, when I served in Iraq, dot, 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 uh, it was criminal, illegal, counterproductive, a war crime, et cetera, et cetera. I was still using that verb served because we, you know, we have conditioned it so much to that's how we speak about it. And I think that just shows the magnitude of what we are up against in terms of war and militarism, that we are up against uh, entities, constructs, a, a Leviathan that is able to shape our language, to, to shape American English in a way that American serves English. its own interests. So now go back to the cliche, the trope, the whole 1984, you know, right, control of language, you know, but there's, a, there's an element of truth to that. And so absolutely, Virginia, I completely agree with what you're saying. Thank you, thanks a lot. Um, Virginia Pratt, thank you for your service yeah. uh, to, uh, to people facing foreclosure. Mm. Thank you for your service to, to elderly folks who, um, who need services. Thank you for your, your service on the board of this church and on, on the board of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Magpie, thank you for your service, inspiring and delighting us and commemorating the fallen for so many years. Leonard Lerman, thank you for all the amazing classical music that you have inspired us with over the years. And you have the floor for the next observation or question. Thank Take it you. away, Leonard. Thank you, Dean. I regret that I had to be uh, in church this morning until fairly recently. I did hear the last song of Magpie. It was brilliant. I loved the update, guys. You're terrific. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the folk singers uh, like Phil Oaks and you and Buffy St. Marie and, and uh, Pete Seeger are the only voice that we should be listening to in, on this whole issue. Um, and uh, I remember what Howard Zinn said uh, that, uh, the, about flags. I, was, you know, I raised my hand when you started talking about flags, Matthew. Um, Howard Zinn said famously, there is no flag mm. so large that it can cover the shame of killing innocent people. Uh, and uh, he was thinking of, of uh, the bombing raids that he was actually part of in Europe in mm. World War II, and, and of course, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Vietnam, and, and, and. And um, in 2005, there was a conference on Sacco and Vanzetti. He was the keynote speaker, and they, um, they wanted to quote that uh, in the book that came out about it. And uh, they asked me to call him and say, where did, where did that go? <laughs> Where did that quote come from? Where did you first say that? And he said, I can't remember. I said it so many times. Um, but uh, we, we finally decided it was uh, at a meeting of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and publication of theirs. So they were given credit you know, for, for the first place that he said that. It may have been, but uh, we don't know. Um, in, um, uh, apropos uh, mili uh, resistance to uh, the, uh, the military, um, that, was the, uh, that was the real crime that Sacco and Vanzetti were convicted of. Of being draft dodgers and anti uh, uh, and anarchists and, and anti patriotic, that's that's why they were railroaded to their deaths. And uh, this morning, I actually played as a postlude in search the um, the um, uh, opening of Act Two of the opera Sacco and Vanzetti, which is a Memorial Day parade, and it's very ironic. Uh, it's all about uh, uh, our country, right or wrong, love it or leave it, and and it's it's, it's it was the the the, 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 the um, uh, the uh, setup for the trial. It, was, it happened just right after Memorial Day and they just had a parade. And I put those words to a communist march that Mark Blitzstein had written in 1937 uh, or 35, Into the Streets May 1st. So the, 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 the uh, congregation heard Into the Streets May 1st uh, called the Memorial Day Parade. They didn't know what they were hearing, but I, I, I told some of them later who wanted to know. In two weeks, of course, Dean, we're coming back to community church for the first time in 16 years. Uh, we're, we've been looking for it all this time. And we will be doing music from the opera Sacco and Vanzetti, as well as uh, songs about the Rosenbergs. And I hope that some of you or even all of you uh, can be there either live or, or, uh, or on Zoom. This will be a, 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 a homecoming. Dean, we're uh, so looking forward to uh, seeing you, meeting you, looking at Bob DiTilio's collection. I had an hour long conversation with Jerry uh, Kaplan 
uh, just the other day, and he's promised to give me a tour. I, I gather that, that it's going to take years before that is cataloged, but I'm eager to look at what you have. And, and, and just uh, really on Skilkis, as they say in Yiddish, uh, 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 preparing to, to be there in two weeks from today. All right. All right, Leonard, thanks, folks. Join us physically here in the auditorium that day to experience the total live experience of, of Leonard and Helene. And, and a, a but third it'll, be on, it'll be on Zoom too, right? Yes, yes. What's the what's the tenor's name? I don't have it in front of me. Christopher um, Remkes. He's going to be singing uh, uh, the title role of Sacco in the orchestral premiere of the work in, in the Bronx in September. He recently was heard as the title role in Candide at uh, New England Conservatory. He's local now. He's, he's from Long Island, but he's been living for a while in Jamaica Plain. So he's joining wonderful. us for that concert. Looking forward to meeting him and want to share this with you. That is from my own garden. I tried for years to get poppies going and finally, finally, I have a really wonderful uh, poppy bush in front of the house. Uh, thanks for uh, indulging me in red poppies this morning. Uh, next we have uh, Packy. Hello, Packy. Uh, join us and uh, welcome to Community Church and uh, you have Thank the floor. You. Thanks, Dean. And uh, it's wonderful to see old friends and uh, and to listen to Magpie, who I've actually had the pleasure of hearing and seeing live and in person, and hopefully we'll be doing more of that. Um, Matt, it's always, I'm always impressed every time I hear you and uh, will go out of my way to hear you. Uh, fortunately, I just had to come over to my desk this morning but, um, but I, there are a couple of things I, I, I want to reflect with you on. Um, one is, is your, you're noting that some people have been very active, uh, you know, our wonderful friend and magpie, Greg, and, uh, and others who have been uh, the faithful uh, opponents to war, waking up very young. And, and I listened to you and I thought, oh my God, he's, he's doing the prodigal son. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we, you know, as part of this community, of course, uh, rather than the, the angry brother who said, oh, what are you taking him back for? Look what he did to say, no, brother, welcome back, because, because you have suffered in ways that those of us who have not been part of that have not. And, uh, and to just welcome you with our, our most open, loving arms to, to everyone who has suffered moral injury. Um, you know, all I can say is, we love you. I love you. Um, they, but I just need to get serious for a moment here uh, to say flags. Um, I've, I've been part of a, a very quiet movement, but, but real, that is, um, is working to get flags out of churches. Yes. And, uh, and it's actually been quite interesting to, to hear the re reaction of churches. Uh, you'll be happy to know that in Amherst, First Church has had it out for a long time. Um, and so have other churches. So, um, so for those of you who go to church or know people who go to churches, um, I would encourage you to encourage them or, or your churches to take the flags out. Um, it's, it's a small token of being, of, of, of standing in opposition to this, this Christian nationalism or, or religious nationalism. Um, and as you said, Matt, there's so many different ways that we can, we can oppose uh, this, this way of, of the military, industrial, media, et cetera, complex. Um, and I can never get Mickey Mac all right, but um, but I, I just want to thank you and, and to thank everyone who's who's really struggling today with how we uh, how we do make differences and to and to instill in us a hope not not the hope that's um, you know if I do this uh, then you know there'll be ice cream tomorrow, but rather. Uh, to know that every time we take these stands, whether it's your beautiful music, uh, the, the articulation of, of your life story and has it, how it interweaves with our movement forward to a just 
and peaceful world, um, we're moving in that direction to create that world that Aaron Dottie Roy has said is possible, that we all know is possible. And, uh, and even if we don't see it, we have to keep planting the seeds and maybe one day the poppies will grow in our yards too. Um, Matt, any, any last words you have or encouragement or, or suggestions that, that we might do? Oh, excuse me. Tomorrow in your neighborhood in, in North Carolina, folks are actually doing a, a, a pro-peace presentation. Our, our friends, the, uh, the Raging Grannies down there are singing and, uh, and Anne Wright is gonna be on, on camera, mm -hmm. on, on film speaking to the group and you may even be there yourself. Um, but, and also just to, to ask if you have any thoughts about it and to invite everyone to come to the Poor People's Campaign gathering on June 18th in Washington, DC. There are buses from everywhere. Um, it's a great opportunity to take a stand for everything Matt has encouraged us to do this morning. And um, so please do that. And so, sorry, I took so much time. I love you, Matt, and all of you here. Paki bowing out. Thank you, uh, Paki, so much. Uh, I love you too. Uh, thank you for the, um, thank you for the reference to the prodigal son. Uh, just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, I can't, Mickey, Matt, um, I've got on my wall here, uh, I've got Ray McGovern's bolo. Exactly. I do too. <laughs> I do right here. I've got it framed um, from when he protested. People could see this. Our friend Ray, when he protested uh, Hillary Clinton uh, okay. and the State Department um, Diplomatic Security Service put out, you know, a bolo, be on the lookout, right, for Ray McGovern. Uh, it says, if McGovern is encountered, use caution. Those are all in capital words, right? Capital letters. Stop and conduct a field interview. Contact the DS command center, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, so, but uh, yeah, he's got Mickey Matt is uh, military, industrial, congressional, <laughs> intelligence, media. Okay. And I can't remember after that. So okay. <laughs> there's a few more. Um, but your point about getting the flags out of church is something that I think is really important and really poignant. There was no Roman eagle uh, next to Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. Um, there was no portrait of uh, uh, Caesar uh, hanging on the wall of the Last Supper. Um, I, I think um, the capture of uh, the church of, of Christianity uh, is something that is centuries old. I mean, this goes back to Constantine, right? So um, nothing new, but it's something I think that has to be fought. And I too always cringe if I'm in a church and I see uh, the flags uh, of political states present um, behind the altar. Uh, you know, uh, it's just is something that has never set well with me. So I really, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing with that, pa Packy. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Packy, I hope this flag is okay for, for a church. As we live, so live all, flags and countries rise and fall. In the rhythm of this planet, I can hear my own heart call, to quote uh, Jay Mankita. Um, Charlie Welch, you're next, or maybe it's Karen. Go ahead. Uh, it's a remark Karen put in the chat. She's just asking you to comment on the fact that there's a half million junior R ROTC uh, high school students in this country. And can you reflect on that? Oh boy, yeah. And I just kind of remember to, to, to uh, endorse what P Packy said about um, uh, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, I think that Reverend Barber, and the Poor People's Campaign have been one of the few uh, organizations that, with the prominence and the potential political clout that have really grasped on to Dr. King's, um, you know, an, an understanding and announcement of the triplets of evil, uh, you know, 
uh, racism, militarism, and capitalism. Um, I, I, I think, uh, and so uh, I would second what Paki said about supporting uh, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, yeah, I, I remember being at a uh, uh, with Veterans for Peace at a Veterans Day march. Uh, at a Veterans Day march in um, I don't know how many years ago. And it was the first time I've been at a Veterans Day parade in a long time. I mean, a long, long time, uh, uh, you know, maybe since I've been a kid or something uh, and astounded at the number of junior ROTC uh, cadets, students, children uh, that were marching. And um, I, I think there is uh, well, David Swanson writes about this quite a bit, the connection between uh the military junior rotc including and mass shootings there's a clear connection some crazy percentage of mass shooters or veterans you know uh david's done quite a good, bit of good work on that but also too the the uh insidious way that the military goes down into the seventh grade uh to uh indoctrinate uh condition uh children to join the military, giving them this idea that uh, not just all the patriotism and the uh, the, the glory of war and the the, the uh, uh, delights of militarism, not just that, but the idea that this is your only way out, that ROTC in the United States military is the only way that you are going to achieve success is the only way that you're gonna get out of your neighborhood. Look around here at this, and this is this is what I see with it. Look around here at this middle school, at this high school year, and it's completely under-resourced. You got, I mean, things are falling apart. You've got 50 kids in your class. There's no activities, there's no opportunities. The kids, I, half your half the kids are failing, half the, you know, quarter or, th or, or 30% of the guy, uh, kids aren't graduating. Those who are, what are they going on to do? Because this is who they prey on. Uh, this is uh, a point I think Virginia was, was, was bringing up a bit earlier uh, about this idea of, of, of people going into the military because they see it as a service. And I think most people who do, do go into the military believe that they are going to be wearing a white hat. It's going to give them purpose. But there's also, too, as we know, the poverty draft, the real economic exploitation of those joining the military. And ROTC <laughs> helps shape that and funnel that. Uh, my, I, I have a, a neighbor. Uh, their daughter uh, came, their Wi-Fi wasn't working. She came over to print something out for a school assignment. And um, we were talking and uh, she's a sophomore. And I said, a sophomore in high school, and I said, what are you interested in doing? You know, and, and um, uh, you know, she started talking about the Air Force uh, because among other things, the recruiter taught her, we'll teach you how to swim. And, you know, this is a, my neighborhood is, is not, a wealthy neighborhood to say the say it the least and you know the opportunities for children to do something as simple as learning how to swim aren't really here for a lot of these families and so something as subtle something as uh i don't know beneficent as, as beneficial as, as as harmless as teaching someone how to swim becomes a recruiting ploy and maybe it's through J junior ROTC that kids learn how to swim, right? And so you're, you're, you're getting this connection between the military and, you know, not just the, the quote service as Virginia was talking about, but the individual benefits, whether it be a, a way out of the family, the neighborhood, the community that you're in. Uh, you know, and this, this is something that I hear quite a bit. Uh, I've heard quite a bit, uh, you know, uh, the, among, uh, uh, you know, black and, and black and brown communities, uh, you know, the military is a way to get into the middle class. Something that where else is that option? You know, and so um, junior ROTC is far more insidious, I think, than just the notion of, of, of these young children, these young, young uh, men and women, uh, not even teenagers in some case, uh, being uh, uh, not just 
taught, but being put through the actions of militarism, not just the uniforms, not just the marching, but the conditioning. And I, I think junior ROTC is is incredibly dangerous. Uh, it is it is um, a, 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 I think it 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 even for those in the vast majority, I think of those who are in junior ROTC do not go into the military, but it creates a conditioning for them where the military is seen as uh, an avenue of opportunity, uh, which is, of course is a very exploitive avenue of opportunity. Hi, Dean. It's Alan. Can I jump in real quick? I have to. I have to depart the conversation. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, uh, this is Alan. Up, I'm in Maine, uh, member of the church. And, and uh, Matthew, you had asked for like suggestions or ideas of what people should do or could do, or et cetera. And and I, I just want to briefly share that I'm of the opinion. And I and I apply it to myself that uh, while all kinds of civic involvement, et cetera, is is critical and and it's a big part of my life, uh, but there at, at the other at the at the outer end of the that activity spectrum is activities that really put something of my life at risk, uh, financial holdings and property, uh, freedom. Uh, you know, risk going to jail, for example, um, uh, certainly risk to reputation, that we all need to think about taking some kind of activity that really goes there. And, and I think you're a wonderful example of putting your, your own well-being in, in some danger by, by confronting the U.S. Uh, power establishment in so many ways. And I thank you for that. Um, myself, I'm a war tax resistor. I have been for 25 years, and uh, you know, I really I risk going to jail. Uh, I risk having my property seized. Uh, I, I risk my whole comfortable life being disrupted. And, um, and and I don't. I actually I tend to live below the poverty line or the the taxable income line, so I don't have a a, a lot of uh, liability to the federal government. I've, I've kind of chosen to do it that way, but at the same time, I'm very public about it. And and um, the, the the point's the same. So, you know, we get all these emails, of sign a petition, and da, da 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 da. Maybe you should do that. Maybe you shouldn't. But at some point, we really need to think about putting my good name and my good living right on the line. And uh, and I'm not suggesting any specific thing anyone should do, but that should be the question that we should all take very seriously, I think. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. And thanks for your resistance, uh, Alan. Um, I've been a war tax resistor since 2015. Um, uh, similarly, because of my disability, I haven't been making much money. So I, again, I, I don't have a big liability uh, with the federal government. Um, but being a war tax resistor has been one of the most freeing and liberating things I have done and experienced. Um, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee, NUTRIC, is a wonderful yeah. organization full of people that are so supportive. And there's a thousand different ways you can do war tax resistance. Uh, if you hold back one penny, you are resisting the federal government in its wars. That's it. Just one penny you could hold back. And you mean, because you are now in violation of U.S tax code and the U.S. law and the IRS and everything else. So it's not like you have to. I mean, there are a, a thousand different ways you can do it. Um, um, unfortunately, I ended my war tax. Now that I'm running a political campaign, I ended my war tax resistance this year uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one of them being that I feel that since I have the platform to talk about taxation, wars, militarism, um, I, I being a war tax resistor is not something I need to do. Uh, however, it's something I will go back to in the future um, uh, because I do believe it is the right thing. If you oppose war, uh, you should not pay for it. And I'm someone who's a, a I'm a modern uh, uh, money, uh, I'm a modern monetary theory 
uh, adherent. So I'm not a person who believes there's a big pot of money in Washington, D.C. and what goes in must come out like I don't, you know, so, uh, you know, and I certainly know that Matt Ho not providing uh, however much he owes to the U.S. government. It's not going to stop the U.S. war machine, <laughs> you know, even if it was that pot of money where what goes in must come out kind of thing. So I, I, I get that. But uh, certainly if people want to talk about war tax resistance, uh, probably running this political campaign, that's my biggest regret is is having to end my war tax resistance. Uh, but um, it is something um, that has been really freeing and liberating now. And th thank you for doing it for 25 years and for being a leader with it. Okay, thanks. We have one last uh, hand up from Ken. Will you unmute Ken? Yes. Hello, you. Ken. Hi. Hi. And thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, in terms of what you were talking about, your own evolution um, and what you said today, um, I w and I'm sure there's a direct connection between uh, that and your running for Senate. And I wondered if you just wanted to speak briefly about why you decided to run for Senate. Um, I'm sure that you're getting the message out to some people through your candidacy. Yeah, thank you, Ken. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, I was asked to run by the Green Party. Um, and there are two sides to it, I guess, why I say yes. One is the desire for accountability, that we could have a, a government and institution uh, composed of individuals and organizations that have not experienced any accountability, who have not been held responsible for their actions, uh, you know, not just with the wars, but with the, uh, say, just most recently with the pandemic, uh, with the fact that we have tens of thousands of people every year before the pandemic who die because they don't have health care insurance. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the examples are, are legion. Uh, of of the the suffering that has been intentionally caused by the deliberate decisions of American politicians and their donors, um, and so some degree of accountability uh, is what I'm looking for. Look, the, when when George Bush, as I'm sure as you all all uh, saw, when George W. Bush uh, a week or two ago made that gaffe, as they said, and uh, accidentally said Iraq rather than Ukraine, and the response was laughter. And uh, media commentators shrugging and smirking and say, oh, there goes Bush again. Just another gaffe by Bush. You know, that's that's the Bush we love. You know, that's disgusting. It's obscene and it shouldn't be tolerated. And the, 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 we need accountability for the actions that have ruined tens of millions of lives. Uh, and then the other is, is, is uh, look, we have uh, people in my in my life, and I'm sure everyone in this audience does as well, who are suffering, who are suffering because, again, of deliberate policy decisions by our government uh, to prioritize the benefit of the few over the the health, the well-being, the safety uh, of, 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 the, of the tens and tens of millions of Americans. Uh, so it, it is those two things, the desire for accountability and the need, the urgency to deal with uh, the suffering, uh, whether it's through, uh, uh, look, 43% of working families are either uninsured or underinsured uh, for health care. Uh, we see rents in North Carolina going up 20 to 25% as wages go down for what, the 45th year in a row. Inflation is now something that we we haven't had to deal with for decades, but now we are. And the the there's no argument saying that it's going to get any better. And we see these all as deliberate financialization policies of the last 50 plus years by the federal government, by both parties. So, you know, we need to stop that it's only going to get worse. And that's not even mentioning the crisis with democracy and the ongoing but worsening uh, climate collapse we are experiencing. And I'm sure everyone else here could add in a few other issues. But so it's the desire for accountability and the suffering I see in my, my own family, my friends, uh, my neighbors, uh, because of deliberate government policies. Thank you, Matt. One last one from uh, Dorothy. Go ahead, Dorothy. Go ahead, Dorothy. Dorothy, you there? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think I unmuted myself. This, this couldn't be easy, my question. What do we think about Ukraine? Is it, you know, defendable if you were a Ukrainian person uh, to fight in that war? What do we think of that war at this point? Yeah, I, I view uh, uh, Ukraine as uh, a, 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 an invasion and occupation by Russia of Ukraine, a clear violation of, of the international uh, law as we understand it post Nuremberg, uh, a war of aggression. Um, that's not to say that's not to say that there are not uh, many, many, many things that occurred uh, in the years, the decades prior to February 2022, uh, that participated, that provoked, that caused this war. Look, you push people, you keep pushing someone, they're eventually going to push back. And I think that's what happened here. Um, I do not support either Washington or Moscow. I believe the war in Ukraine is a dirty war, a war meant for fossil fuel control, as well as larger commerce issues, and meant to sa satiate the uh, megalomania of both Washington and Moscow. Um, I don't think um, the idea of victory in Ukraine is something that's possible in the sense of a World War II style victory that would require an army. Uh, and when I say an army, I mean an army in the military sense, talking three to five core of uh, armor mechanized and infantry uh, units, so upwards of 15 to 20 uh, divisions to invade Ukraine to kick Russia out. Uh, what is possible, though, which is horrifying, is an endless war. And you're seeing the, the remnants of that. Look, remember the United States just went, uh, uh, spent $7 trillion on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan over 20 years. More importantly, spent $14 trillion on its military over those 20 years without any economic consequence, without $30 trillion in debt has no effect on us. Um, so the United States is in the position to spend tens and tens of billions every year continuing the war in Ukraine. We can do that. We have the world's reserve currency. It's no problem for the United States to do that. Um, the idea that United States then provides uh, as the Ukraine as the war in Ukraine settles into a stalemate, uh, a border uh, conflict uh, where it goes back and forth a little bit, but it's pretty much confined to the east. You then have this idea that the United States sends more weaponry that continues to stalemate that 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 produces a stalemate uh endlessly you know it's the idea that the united states starts sending uh and its european allies start sending uh anti-aircraft missile systems uh long-range artillery long-range rocket systems that they're now proposing to do uh that allow for this standoff in eastern ukraine to continue indefinitely I mean, so the answer in uh, and then, of course, you have to deal with the understanding of the horror, the, 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 the tragedy, the, the, the suffering of the Ukrainian people through all this. The idea that we'll fight the United States will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian is very real. Um, and then the, the everything we know about war, that war is a breeding ground of unintended consequences and that just as every other war, things will come of this that we could not predict and we cannot control. Um, the idea that somehow this war will be utilized to overthrow Vladimir Putin is a mistake. More than likely, in my opinion, what would happen is that uh, Vladimir, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, pushes for negotiations, pushes for a ceasefire, and he's overthrown by a right wing uh, coup in Ukraine that want to continue the war. Uh, I think that's a more likely outcome than seeing Vladimir Putin disposed, deposed because of the war. You know, but that's even just speculation. I mean, as Yogi Berra said, uh, predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. And war makes them even harder. Uh, you know, look at the, the and, and the, but when you compound them, say the, the uh, Afghan war, the proxy war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan produces Al Qaeda. Uh, the Iraq invasion produces Al Qaeda in Iraq. The Syrian uh, invasion, of course, creates and solidifies the Islamic State, right? So you continue to have these Frankenstein monsters that continue, as well as just, the, again, the unintended consequences. You know, like I said, Zelensky could be out, right? You know, and some right wing uh, uh, junta 
takes charge in Ukraine. Uh, these are all possibilities. And so the horror of that, the danger of that, and of course, the ever present specter of nuclear war, which to everyone's uh, great, uh, 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 we all should be uh, terrified that both sides, not just the American side, but the Russian side as well, have generals, have political leaders, have pundits, have experts who claim that nuclear warfare is winnable. Both sides, both the American and Russians, claim to have usable nuclear weapons. And we have to, have to remember that throughout the Cold War, both NATO and the Warsaw Pact had war plans that called for using nuclear weapons, not eventually, but right away. And so that terror, that, that, I, that, that Holocaust that could come from this means the urgency to get to a ceasefire, a negotiations, and an end to the war. I'm in favor of the Minsk II agreements. I'm in favor of Russia pulling back, of course. I'm in favor of some type of autonomy for the eastern part of Ukraine. Most importantly, a military non-aligned uh, Ukraine, uh, a neutral Ukraine. I would extend that to other nations as well throughout. But um, but that was that's that's what I see. And what I see our role is is because as I said earlier. The entire Democratic Party is all in on sending tens and tens of billions of dollars to uh, the Ukraine war to continue it in perpetuity endlessly without any type of negotiation, ceasefire, settlement. The, the, uh, our role then against this Leviathan is to provide these alternatives to, be, uh, uh, to, to speak for the Ukrainians who are suffering, to speak for the Russian soldiers who are being put in this war, uh, you know, and, and killing and being killed, uh, you know, for the, the whims of Moscow, just as American soldiers and Marines were put in Iraq and Afghanistan for the whims of, of, of the United States or D.C. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And um, it looks like we might just get one last song out of Greg and Terry to end us on a, a note of inspiration and commemoration and joy. Thank you all for joining us. Magpie, Matthew Ho, it's been a wonderful morning. And uh, take it away, Magpie. Whoops, wrong one. It's okay. Oh, well. Not yet. No. We're not hearing anything yet. Unmute. Oh, can you hear us now? Yes, yes. Okay. Good. For some reason or other, my phantom power went out. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to thank you, Dean, and you requested this song, so everybody sing along because you probably know yeah, you it. You might want to mute, but sing along with it. Last night I had the strangest dream. I've never dreamed before I dreamed the world had all agreed To put an end to war I dreamed I saw a mighty room Filled with women and men And the paper they were signed never fight again and when the paper was all signed and a million copies made they all joined hands and bowed their heads and grateful prayers were prayed and the people in we're dancing round and round While swords and guns and uniforms Were scattered on the ground Last night I had, I had the strangest dream I've ever dreamed before I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. Yes, I dreamed I saw a mighty room filled with women and men. And the paper they were signing said they'd never
Thank you all Thank for you, joining us. Greg Pye. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Joan, for suggesting this program. Our programs are led and uh, driven by uh, member suggestions. Uh, so keep those suggestions coming in and we'll get wonderful events just like this morning. Um, both of you, I hope you will join us physically someday, the sooner the better. Um, Charlie Welch, thank you for your technical help. And, um, and to all of you, I wish you a wonderful long weekend. To all of you, thank you for your service. <laughs> and uh, to the, the veterans in our midst, John Mannheim, Jim Kasteris, Shanti Renfrew, thank you for your service, but to all of you, thank you for what you do to, to make this community run and to make this world run. This is an amazing community right now of people working for peace. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, Matthew, Paki, Virginia, there's so many people here who make a difference. Oh yeah. And you, and you, you include a magical room and you have a candle for the light. If I stood out in the rain night, my only light a candle, a million miles away, would you lay down your fire as I raised mine? Would you not kill again? Everybody have a good week. Make progress. Teach peace. See you all later. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.